right, so uh, I'm actually surprised most of you were using Kotlin on the back end already. Um, this might be a bit too intro for you, <laughs> so I'm afraid. Um, so we've got like about a minute or so before we get started. It was, so for the, for the people watching the recording, it it's looked like around 80% of the audience is actually using Kotlin on the back end already. Um, most of the audience is uh, server side and uh, there are very few Android and web developers here. <laughs> so, um, I guess we can begin. Should I wait until like 10.15? Okay, we're good. All right, so uh, in this session, I'm gonna cover what's a backend, which is probably a little bit too uh, intro for you folks, if like most of you are server developers. <laughs> Um, what to look for in a server framework. Again, a bit, probably too intro for most of you. Um, what Kotlin frameworks are available, the pros and cons of each framework, and um, avoiding framework dependencies, and uh, serverless. So, first question is, what's a backend? Any comments from the audience? What do you use your backend for? Nothing. All right. Um, <laughs> come on. All right. Sorry? Keeping track of state. Um, anyone else? REST APIs. All right. So I had REST APIs, using it for your web server, using it for chat servers. So um, also, what Backends are what apps and clients talk to, so users can read dynamic data, so you can share information, so they can authenticate because you know they have to. You have to know who the users are, um, so they can write persistent data, so you can save what users are doing. And backends have to be reliable. While reading dynamic data, that has to scale in case there are lots of users. Um, they have to authenticate and be secure, and they have to also write persistent data while. Um, accounting for things like networks going down, servers going down, et cetera. So what do you look for in a framework? Um, so there are a bunch of features that actually help uh, what we need for a backend. So um, the first of these, of course, well, if, since you're in this talk, Kotlin. This is Kotlin and server. If you're using Kotlin clients, it uh, gives you an isomorphic language, so you can move between both and do development in both. Kotlin is concise and modern, uses extension higher order functions, DSL is coroutines that you expect any, uh, out of a modern language. It has dull and type safety compared to uh, scripting languages. Um, and it's compatible with Java 8. Um, so you don't have to move immediately to Java 9, 10, or 11. A quick show of hands, how many are actually on Java 9, 10, or 11? That's about a quarter of the audience, which is actually still pretty impressive. <laughs> most, most people are still stuck on Java 8. And Kotlin gives you a nice way to use a modern language while staying with Java 8. So um, conciseness, on the left-hand side is the Spring, the uh, DSL for setting up a, a REST API, and Spring is much more verbose in Java, and it's much cleaner in Kotlin. And it's almost the same as uh, the number of lines needed to set up a REST API at Node.js using this the more common uh, ExpressJS uh, framework. So for speed, look for non-blocking um, support in the server, uh, including Kotlin coroutines, Reactor, or RxJava, um, and having a, uh, an event-driven uh, web server backend. Also, um, when you connect, you want to look for something that supports HTTP2, because uh, you don't want clients to do like single connections for every resource they download. And you also want WebSockets, so you can support real-time chat instead of using polling for HT using uh, HTTP. For security, you want uh, support for cores. For, so um, browsers, uh, well, stuff run on browsers knows how to, which uh, domains are valid to connect to. Um, you want CSRF support, so um, people can't just do replay attacks on your website. And uh, you also want OAuth 2 and OIDC support. Um, OAuth 2 is really for delegation, whereas the 
OIDC, which is actually OpenID, or OAuth v2, is also for delegation and authentication, and um, has a lot of uh, server support, including open source ones from Keycloak, Hydra, and you know, non-open source ones from uh, Okta and Auth0. And of course, you want testing. You want your server frameworks to support testing, so there aren't any bugs in your process. So you have unit testing, integration testing. And you also want a server framework to have uh, good documentation, so you can find out how to do things, uh, have a good community of support, and also be able to generate documentation for your APIs. So I guess the question is, which frameworks? There are like so many. So this is like a rough timeline of uh, when the frameworks were released versus uh, the features they have. So the oldest is uh, actually Spring, and that has the most features. On the left-hand side in the lower quadrant, there are, uh, there, there are actual native Kotlin uh, frameworks. These include Java, Ktor, and HTTP4K. And then there are the really sparse frameworks like uh, Spark Java and Rat Pack. And um, there's actually a new one called Micronaut that uh, also has Kotlin support, but it's uh, written by some of the Groovy folks. So uh, Ktor is JetBrains' official um, server framework. It's pure Kotlin. It has, uh, you know, it's, it has a goal of Kotlin native support. It's built in coroutines, web sockets. It's uh, unfortunately the least mature of the pure Kotlin frameworks, but it's catching up rapidly. Um, and it doesn't have a, a tracing and metering support yet, or metric support. So you can see on the right-hand side, it's just a simple DSL for routing, which is uh, still much simpler than the Spring one. Um, Ktor coroutines let you write code uh, in, in a synchronous fashion without, um, you know, without blocking the, the main server loop. And before we go on to the next one, we should um, go over what the old architectures were. So um, the old architectures for web, for uh, server frameworks or server servers were a monolith where um, everything was done in like in one, in one, uh, one monolithic code base. And you, you, mo you may maybe separate it between web and API, but everything was basically one big code base. Um, later on, people went to microservices, so they broke up uh, the servers based on features. So you have web accounting, carts, et cetera. But then they added a gateway on the right side. They, um, they also added extra logging and tracing support to, to track all this stuff going through the different microservices. Um, but then later on, the, the current thing is with uh, the red gateway part, they've currently converted that into a service mesh. And with a service mesh, um, the hard part is how do you figure out you know, if something goes wrong. But service meshes are, because mes service meshes are massively distributed, they're self-healing, they're self-scaling, but then you still have the problem is if something goes wrong, would you, how do you find out? Because, you know, because it's so large, debugging is hard, logging is hard, and performance monitoring is hard. So um, it's really important that you get your tracing in place and you get your metrics in place to be able to find out what things are going on inside your, your ultra complicated distributed system. So um, next framework is HTTP 4K. Uh, it's one of the pure Kotlin frameworks and it's interesting in that it has no magic reflection or annotations. Uh, it also has built in resilience. Uh, you can plug in backends for it um, it also has micrometer support for metrics. It has Swagger support for documentation. So it, it, it has basically more, more things that let you uh, build more uh, larger scale applications than what Ktor is capable of currently. Um, it can also, it's one of the few frameworks in deployed AWS Lambda. Um, it has uh, some GraalVM support already. Uh, it's chaos testing built in, which is uh, unique for all the frameworks. Um, the cons is it doesn't have uh, some of the other um, support for things like coroutines or RxJava, but from the performance, it doesn't really seem to matter. 
Um, it also doesn't have open tracing support, but it does have Zipkin support. And um, the other negative is that it doesn't do automatic JSON encoding decoding for you. You have to call methods that, that do the JSON encoding decoding. So it doesn't have the magic Jackson stuff where you give it objects and it magically translates back and forth. And the routing is pretty simple as well. So another framework is uh, Juby. It has um, a bunch of pluggable backends. It, it runs in an event loop, which is non-blocking. It has RxJava support, Reactor support. It has more modules than HTTP 4K. Um, it has lots of database support. It has built-in job scheduling. It's basically a, more f a framework with more features. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have Kotlin coroutine support. Um, and it, it um, only has uh, support for like um, logback instead of having support for uh, open tracing or Zipkin or something. And um, again, the routing is pretty simple. So uh, as we go up the ladder, we have um, another framework called Vertex. Um, this one adopted Kotlin early on. Um, as a framework started in 2011 and probably started the, uh, the, the reactor pattern style. So they, they hooked in Netty quickly. Um, all their, everything is based on event loops. Um, and everything's not blocking. And if you look at a Tekken Par benchmarks, it's, it's pretty much always near the top. Um, you know, because, because of its age, it has lots of support for micrometer. It, it actually is a bit of a monolith because it supports auto clustering, whereas nowadays you do the, the support for clustering using your, your mesh instead. Um, it has support for multiple languages, which is a bit unusual. So you can write your different pieces of your app in, in Python, Clojure, um, JavaScript even. And um, there, there are other like, layers on top where you can add uh, RxJava support. And um, there's another um, layer on top called Cover that, that does convention over configuration. And uh, again, it Grails VM support is coming soon. Um, it's unfortunately not as mainstream, and I'm not sure about in, in Europe at least, but in the US it's not as mainstream as something like Spring. And it also doesn't have automatic JSON encoding, decoding. But the routing is also relatively simple. They, they adopted Kotlin probably about, about a year ago. So they're one of the first uh, frameworks that actually adopted Kotlin really quickly. So they, they have kind of an interesting architecture in that they have an event bus that runs down to the client where the client is actually, uh, could be actually a browser. So you can send events from the server to the browser directly. And this is what I meant about uh, convention over configuration for one of the uh, layers on top. So instead of uh, using annotations to define gets and puts, everything's implied based on um, the naming of the method. So list blog is automatically a get, uh, find blog by ID is automatically a get, and takes a parameter. So Spring's the most popular framework, um, at least in the US. I'm not sure about in Europe. Um, how many folks out there are using Spring? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, it's the most popular framework here. Um, about probably like 85% of the audience raised their hands. <laughs> Um, it's the most popular framework. There's uh, Spring Web Flux in uh, Spring 5 now. That's also non-blocking. Um, it's some, from performance benchmarks, it's not quite as fast as Vertex. They've got uh, some issues where um, I think something's slow in, in their implementation. Um, the kitchen sink can be a bit daunting because it supports so much stuff. Um, there's a Spring Initializer. Um, there are other layers on top, for example, jhipster that actually auto-generates uh, Spring projects for you. Um, and Grail VM support is coming in 5.2. Um, cons is some of the, the magic requires that your classes be open. So you, uh, you need like special plugins in your Gradle file to, to get that to work. Um, there's no official Kotlin coroutine support yet, but it's coming um, as part of the Spring Foo, Foo incubator project. And unfortunately, it's the slowest framework on the deck and power benchmarks, but it, it's because of all the magic it gives you. So this is how the previous example is how do you do routing normally in Spring. And with the Webflux support they added in, in Spring 5, it supports uh, the Reactive Framework, which is really our, their version of RxJava. 
So it, it, uh, it functions using um, the reactive streams. They, they support the same reactive stream spec. And the nice thing is they're, they're, they have something called Spring Foo, which is an incubator project. And you get to preview stuff that's coming soon, or will be coming soon. One of the later sessions in Colin Conf will cover this. But the, if you remember the, the REST API before, it's not very pretty. I mean, even it's a DSL, it's a Kotlin DSL, but it's still not very pretty. But the Spring Foo uh, rewrite is much better. It's more, more classic uh, Kotlin DSL. Um, there's also the J-Hipster project. Um, how many people have heard of the J-Hipster project? Oh, much less, like 10% of the audience. It, it scaffolds uh, Spring and Angular projects. It's like a quick way to to um, generate um, either a monolith or uh, different microservices. And um, it basically automatically builds you a Netflix uh, OSS stack using Spring Boot. Um, it generates Kotlin. Um, you basically design your data models. You run a magic command. It auto-generates like, a lot of stuff. Um, the, the con is it's kind of hard to find things because it auto generate stuff that you didn't write yourself. So um, this is what their, uh, their tool for um, designing the data model looks like. So you design your data model, you feed that into the command we saw previously in the upper up right hand. There's just one line where you tell what the blueprint is. And then it auto generates a CRUD stack for you with, with all your data models. And it also generates uh, basically a Netflix OSS stack. So it's a, it's a fully scalable CRUD stack that uh, it generates for you. So similarity, you noticed, everything has DSLs because it's Colin. Um, everything takes request headers, parameters. Every, everything has response output. And everything has a context. So for code portability, you should always isolate all the framework APIs. You know, keep your business logic separate. Always have uh, a thin layer that translates between your business logic and the framework APIs. Don't take the examples from the different framework sites because they just call things directly using their uh, framework APIs. Um, isolate your database layer. You know, this is all just best practice, clean art stuff. I isolate all your different layers. Um, talk to your database using like some other layer that's portable. Um, if you're using coroutines or, or Arcs Java, so, you know, try and keep keep using one, and then you can use there. There's a Kotlin X coroutines Rx2 project that lets you translate between the two. Um, there are API facades for logging. There are API facades for tracing and metrics, and you shouldn't you know just tie into one one directly, you know, like Stack Driver or something like that. And I guess the next big thing is what they call serverless, which is kind of a misnomer. It's actually a s someone else's server, and you run functions on it. So it goes under the names as, of uh, Google Cloud Functions, AWS Lambda, OpenFaz, Azure Functions. It's basically you're running um, each API call that's made, spins up your, your, uh, your server and then runs the code and then kills the whole thing and starts it from scratch. So of course, you have JVM limitations. JVMs are always slow to start up. Probably like spring projects take uh, at least sometimes a few seconds at most. I mean, ours takes a few seconds to spin up. Um, if you're lucky, it takes half a second. Um, it uses a lot of memory because the JVM is kind of big unless you're using JDK, JDK9's uh, Jigsaw project. And disk size is kind of huge unless you're using uh, the Jigsaw project as well. So how bad is it? Compared to Node.js, uh, startup is two to three times slower, at least two to three times slower. You end up using one and a half times memory. You end up using five to 10 times the disk space. Even after you include the uh, JavaScript libraries that uh, the JavaScript apps uh, need. And what you end up is, Basically, if, if you want to if you want to pay for this, you end up spending like twice as much on Amazon Lambda. 
And compared to Go, you have two to three times slower startup. Go is actually the fastest uh, start, the fastest and most efficient way to write um, cloud functions. Um, it's two to three times slower startup, it's three times memory, twice the disk space. And if you compare you know, running a JVM app versus running a Go app, on Amazon Lambda, it's roughly eight times the cost because Go is so fast. So I guess the lesson is if, you're, if you have your own server, go ahead and do this. Or if you don't mind spending more money, go ahead and use this technology. But there's hope. Um, there's Graal VM, or also known as Substrate VM, which is actually, well, the Graal VM actually includes other things, but Substrate VM is the one that compiles directly to native code. And a couple of the frameworks support that or are starting to add support for that. Um, these include HTTP4K, Vertex, and upcoming in Spring 5.2. And uh, Ktor also is uh, planning on supporting Kotlin Native, which is the same thing. You're basically compiling to object code, so it starts up a lot faster. So limitations, there's no, net, no dynamic class loading, no JMX VM monitoring, so it, it, you, it, you have to do some work to get it to work in Grail VM. But the result is um, your Vertex app uses three, like, three times less memory. Your HTTP4K app uses four times less memory. Uh, Vertex starts up uh, almost 10 times faster. HTTP4K starts up almost 50 times faster, or at least in these benchmarks. But so it, it, it at least gives you hope. And there, there you, if you want to use Cloud Functions, you should start looking at this. But it's, it's kind of bleeding edge right now. So the lesson is Kotlin all the things. Backends are easy in Kotlin. There are lots of choices. Choose the features you need. Keep your business code portable. A bunch of further reading for you folks. And a bunch of sessions that are probably much better for most of you since you're, you're familiar with servers already. <laughs> and that's it for my presentation. Um, any questions? Uh, the question was, how is, oh, sorry, the previous question was, have I looked at uh, uh, test, how is ease of testing for the different frameworks? And the current question is, um, have I looked at uh, what the KTOR performance is? Um, on that scale, KTOR is uh, a bit slower than HTTP 4K. It's actually surprisingly good. So it's probably around uh, 20th on the tech and power scale, whereas uh, HTTP 4K is like around 11, and Vertex is around three. So three from the top. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you, and have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>